and welcome everybody watching by live stream. We love you. We're honored by you very much. Uh, if you do us a favor and share the stream, uh, if you're on YouTube, just subscribe to the channel. If you're on Facebook, use your finger, give the devil the finger, and tell the world that Jesus is one by sharing the message on live stream right now. Like, you're irreverent, pastor. Yes, I'm irreverent, I know. But I honor the Lord. That's what I do know. So we're talking about keys to life in the Spirit. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit who's given to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's writing to this church and he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts. He uses a Greek word, pneumatika. And it means concerning the atmosphere and all things pertaining to the Holy Spirit. The word for spiritual gifts is charismata. That is not the Greek word that is used here. It's pneumatika. And it means concerning the atmospheres of the Spirit. I would not have you ignorant. You know that when you were Gentiles or before you were believers, you were carried around by dumb idols and everything you worshipped is what led you. So what's the contrast here? He's telling this church, like, look, you're born again. You know, you're not to be led by things that you worshipped in the past. You're to be led by the Spirit. Well, what did we worship in the past? Cars, money, jobs, girls, guys. You know, we worship relationships. As a believer, we're not to be led by things of that nature. We're to be led by the Spirit. Why? Because Jesus has a better plan for your life than you do. Anybody with me on that? Yeah? He's got a better plan. He knows what you need long before you ask. The problem that most Christians have is they don't engage the Lord. We hold the Lord at a distance. Or we engage Him in some sort of a pseudo manner, in a way that we think He relates. We don't relate to Him on the way that we think, right? And we can't do anything without him, His presence. We have to engage Him in the manner that He's prescribed. But when we do engage Him, life comes into our world. Life comes into us and through us. And so Paul is telling this church, I don't want you to be ignorant of the things that relate to the Holy Spirit. Ignorant doesn't mean you're stupid, it just means you don't know. So the church is not to be unaware of the Holy Spirit. We're to know Him. We're to understand Him. Contrary to popular belief, He's not gone. He's still here. Seven out of ten American churches believe that the miracles have ended. We wonder why we have a problem. Let me just say that again. Seven out of ten churches believe that Jesus doesn't heal, that there's no power, that nothing is active. That's 70% of the American church. Maybe not 70% of believers, but that's 70% of the doctrine that's being taught to the believer. Well, who told you that? That's my question. Jesus never took away his gifts. He's not an Indian giver. He never withdrew the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's alive and he's present. The other 30%, most of them believe in miracles but don't see any. <laughs> and then you have the percentage of churches that believe in miracles and they do see them where they believe that the Spirit's power is present and active, and there's a demonstration or there's a witness and a testimony among that church that we see miracles all the time. Not somebody's parking getting paid. We see people healed. Tumors, all kinds of sickness, disease, you name it. Rheumatoid arthritis. Seen probably four people healed of rheumatoid arthritis. Right? I mean, we're, these miracles aren't in a sweet by and by. These aren't in 1972. These miracles are in the last six months. <laughs> I mean, you want me to go back seven years and count miracles? Well, we'll be here all day. I'm, this stuff happens here all the time. I had a guy at first service, he was telling me, he said, man, one of the things you convicted me on, um, and that you really do this message, is he said, you started talking about that in the last days, they will profess godliness, but they will deny power. And he said, that just wrecked me. You know, just wrecked me. We profess a form of godliness, but we can't manifest kingdom. What's our problem? We have a problem, right? Laodicean church, rich is in need of nothing. Jesus said, I say you're blind, naked, and poor. Right? Got all the trappings of success, but yet we can't manifest kingdom. Number one rebuke upon the early church was their inability to manifest power. Number one rebuke wasn't immorality. Everybody wants to say that Paul was correcting the early church because of immorality. It wasn't immorality. It was powerlessness. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, having begun in the spirit, now why do you teeter towards the flesh? He's correcting uh, Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he's already correcting them. In 1 Corinthians, he's re-navigating re their power that they're demonstrating. But by 2 Corinthians, the second letter, he's telling him, you've been, you've been seduced. You're being carried away. Book of Ephesus. The book of Revelation. Jesus said you were uh, talking about the church of Ephesus. Said you've lost your first love. Repent and go back to the first works. Well, they need to go back to the loving atmosphere that they had in the beginning. Wrong answer. What was Ephesus' first works? Read the book of Acts. Ephesus' first works was kingdom power. 
They were demonstrating kingdom power. The believers were manifesting the glory of God in ever-present activities within their lives. That was their first works. But they had become so doctrinally centered that they had neutered the power of God. We become culturally relevant and we become kingdom irrelevant. That's this generation. That's this church. That's the American church in the modern culture. And this is the gospel that we export. Cultural relevancy, but kingdom irrelevancy. That's true. It's true. Our signs and wonders are all of the things that we can do. The cars that we can bring on stage, the pastors that rappel with a rope down into the, you know, hey, I go to that. I'm like, what? Pastor's going to come down on a bungee cord? Bro, I'm in. Let's go. You know? <laughs> Somebody had a rolling drum cage. I was like, where? When? Sunday night? Boom, I'm there. Let's go. But that's not our sign and wonder, man. That's not our sign and wonder. Our sign and wonder is the ability to manifest the power of God in the life of the believer, not just through the pastor, but through the everyday church. Jesus wants spiritual worshipers. The Father is seeking what? Worshipers in what? Come on. In, exactly. Exactly. So what is God commanding the church to produce? Spirit-filled believers. That's what, so <laughs> Jesus said, it's to my benefit that I go, for if I do not go, the Holy Spirit won't come. So Jesus is telling us something, and it just goes whoop right over our head. He's saying, better than me being here is the active presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And we don't pay attention to that? Wait a minute, we should pay attention to that. We should be, as Paul says, concerning the Holy Spirit, we should not be ignorant. We should not be unknowing. He is the everything. He is the manifester of the kingdom to come. He is everything. He's the one who brings forth the believer's inheritance. We're not to be ignorant of the things concerning the Holy Spirit. He's saying, don't, we're not following the things that we used to worship. We follow now him. Our leading voice is the Lord. That's who we, who, who we follow. The Holy Spirit is an endowment. You guys ever heard the old story where brides get a dowry, right? When they get a dowry. You know what I'm talking about? You know, that's old school, right? Bride would come with a dowry. Their father would give a dowry. So when the husband married the bride, the bride would come with a dowry. Well, we have a dowry. We're engaged to the Holy Spirit, are we not? And our Father has endowed us. We have a dowry to present. And the dowry is, is the presence of the Holy Spirit, but it's also his gifts. The Holy Spirit is our endowment. He comes bearing gifts. I want you to say this. They're gifts. They're not awards. You don't earn them. They're given. I want you to say this. The gifts remain dormant unless they are activated and developed. Every believer is given the Holy Spirit. Every single believer. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into you. When you come to Christ, the Bible says that the Spirit of God seals our heart. We are sealed by Him. He, is, he comes in us. Jesus said He is with you. He will be in you. John 15, right? He comes in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. But there's a, that, that is a, that's a Greek word called charisomai. So when the Holy Spirit comes into the believer, it's charisomai. It's His presence in form of potential. Charisomai becomes chariz charismata when we begin to activate the gifts. Most Christians, they have charisomai. They have the Holy Spirit, and like, he pretty much could take a nap all day, and they wouldn't even know he wasn't around. Right? Charisomai. We carry the potential, but we don't carry the activation. There's a huge difference. Charisomai and charismata. In order to move the potential and the power of the Holy Spirit through not just in our lives but over our lives, we have to activate Him and develop Him. Christians can activate in the gifts. We activate you all day long. Anybody been to our activation schools? Right? Yeah? You guys got a little bit of a new crowd here. Yeah, you've been there. So, yeah. <laughs> we activate you. You see, you can prophesy. We see you lay hands on the sick and they recover, right? See, it happens. Yeah, we, see, we, we show you. We show you how to have a vision encounter. You can have a vision. What? Visions? Visions are not of God. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will see visions. Dreams and visions are the first thing imparted to this church. Prophetic dreams and visions. We're a generation of visionaries and dreamers are powered with prophetic voice. Acts chapter 2. Everyone has been given this. The issue isn't whether or not you have it. The issue is do you want to manifest? Most people don't want it. You don't have to worry about the Holy Spirit. Say, if I don't, say this with me. If I don't want the Holy Spirit to do anything in my life, he's not going to. You don't have to worry about it. The Holy Spirit is never going to do anything unless you do it with him. He'll just stand there. He'll watch you live your life. He'll watch you struggle. You know? He'll watch you just burn yourself out in your own strength. He, he, you, he will never do anything for you. He only does it with you. 
Yeah? You can't do it without him, and he won't do it for you. He'll do it with you. That's why the Christian, this is why we have so much rage against the machine or anger against God, is we're expecting God to do something for us. Your theology is wrong. He doesn't do it for you. He does it with you. God does nothing unless you participate. Lord's not going to fight your battles. We just sang the song, Lord of hosts, you're with us. He's not going to fight your battles unless you invite him. You ever done that? You don't invite the Lord and you're on your own because he doesn't cross into that threshold until you invite him. It's very, very true. If you don't ask him, he's not coming. You don't have to worry about it. You can be nominal, average, everyday Christian, and you'll be in safe company because that is the vast majority, particularly in America, of all Christians. The vast majority, safe and comfortable, manifest nothing. Come and go, come and go, come and go. Affect destiny? Not at all. Jesus has called us to affect destiny. The end of the day, what we have to come to terms with is that we are accountable for our lives. The believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not the white throne of, that judges sin, but we will stand before the bema seat, which is the seat of reward. You will account, not for your salvation, but you will account for the treasure that's been given to you. And ladies and gentlemen, ignorance is not an excuse. God will not tolerate ignorance in that day. Did you not have my spirit? Did you not have my word? Your reward, not your eternity, so we have salvation and we have destiny. We have two different pieces of this equation. The unbeliever comes before a white throne. The believer comes before a bema seat, the seat of reward. Not all rewards are equal. Everything you do for him, Corinthians says, that you do for Jesus, every part of you that participates in the kingdom, every part of you that participates in destiny is refined as gold and silver. That is, and it's given to you. Your life is going to be tried. And the way Paul's trying to relate it to us, because we can't understand heavenly things, so it has to be related to us in an earthly thing, he shows us that our lives will be tried. Right? Our lives as a believer. The unbeliever, forget it. Don't go past go. That's over. It's done. You reject Christ, there's nothing left. There is no hope. You're not reasoning yourself out of that on that day. It's not going to happen. That's why you need to give your life to Christ. You need to give your life to Jesus. He's an eternal salvation. He is the present hope in time of need. But the believer, to the believer, you go before the throne and your life will be examined. He's going to look at you. He's not going to be impressed with your shell collection or your stock portfolio. He has no interest in that. If you had a stock portfolio and you used that money and you, part of that money funded the kingdom, well, of course he's interested in it. Every single thing that points back to you, the Bible says, will be burned away by, as hay, wood, and stubble. But they will be saved but by smoke. So when we get to the kingdom, if you see people with their butts smoking, it's because they just barely got in. Whoo! Man! I'm here! <laughs> it's true. So you can be born again and not carry treasure forth into the kingdom. You have eternal life. Everyone has, you, you have equality. Your needs will be met. The Bible says it uses this language, everyone will have a fig tree. So in, in other words, everyone will have, a, will have provision. You, you don't have to worry about that. You're eternally saved. You're part of this kingdom. But as for me, that's why Paul says, let us cast aside every weight that does so easily beset us. Let us run this race with endurance and let us quest for the upward calling. Let's go higher. Let's go further. You can drive a Ferrari in this life. I'm, that's fine with me because I want one in the kingdom because nobody's taking that away. That's mine. I get a new Ferrari every single year, right? Eternally. Store up treasure in heaven where moth does not eat and, and corruption doesn't exist. You know, that's where we put our treasure. We put our treasure through partnerships with him. And God has given us the power and the ability to manifest this partnership. He's given us his spirit. He's called us to something impossible and he's given us the power to achieve it. You realize that? I don't know if you all know this. Ready? Why don't you say this with me? So oh, I'm not talking about being born again, right? Say it with me. The pastor is not talking about being saved. He's talking about living as a Christian. That's what I'm talking about, okay? So being saved and living as a Christian. To live as a Christian is impossible. Anybody with me? You, you can't do it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't do it. You know, love those who hate you. Do good to those who do evil to you. Oh, you can try until somebody's really hurt you, and then you can't, you can't bring that forth. He's called you to the impossible. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Honor your husband in all things. We could go deeper on that one, but I'm going to be safe for you, ladies. As Abraham called him Lord. <gasps> Honor him to that level. That's what he's saying. Love her like Christ loved the church. You don't have that power. You don't possess it in and of yourself, but in the spirit, you have the power. Do you not? Huh? Are you with me? 
In the power, in the spirit, in the immersion of the spirit, you can forgive everybody. You don't hold a grudge ever. In the immersion of the spirit, you love that woman, you can give her your life, it's not a problem at all. In the spirit, you can honor your husband, you can respect him, but in the flesh, it's impossible. So what I'm trying to say to you is that God calls us to something impossible, but doesn't leave us alone. He empowers us to achieve the impossible. Not just in our own personal lives. He empowers us to achieve the impossible as high as you want to go. So the Spirit is given to us as an empowerment to handle the basic things. But the Holy Spirit doesn't stop there. See, here's the problem. Most of us don't even engage the Spirit on the basic things, right? We think we can do it in our own strength. We think it's our spiritual disciplines that are going to get us across the line. We think it's our word and our doctrine. Listen, I've been doing this a long time. It's not going to work. So you can keep striving if you want to. You can engage the Spirit, and it gets a whole lot easier. It gets a whole lot easier. <laughs> like big time easier. So what, most of the time we don't engage them on the basic things, but if you just engage them on the basic things, there's so many layers to this. There's so many levels to this. He's without limit. You want destiny? He's all in. First thing he's going to do, he's going to teach you the basic things. If you cannot run with the footman, how will you contend with the horses? If you can't keep up with the joggers, Kevin, how are you going to get on the horse and ride? That's what he's saying. If you can't do minor things and you don't know remedial math, you're not launching a rocket. FYI. And so we have to learn the basic things and build into that. And God will lead you into basic things. He's going to lead you into basic things. He's going to teach you your identity. He's going to teach you some sense of purpose. And then he's going to, his hope is to illuminate you to some sense of destiny. Most Christians, we can't even get there. I mean, it's, just like, it's unbelievable. We, we can't get there. But, but the good news is, is that we're called there. And my thing is, it's like, Lord, if you've called me there, then I want it. I want it. I don't want to hold anything back. I want everything you have for me. But the Spirit is our endowment. He comes bringing gifts, not awards. They're yours, but they're dormant until you activate them. Dormant. Would the gifts come in these forms? So the first one is discernment. So there's discernment, declarative, and dynamic. Ha ha. I love that word, dynamic. You all have discernment gifts. You have the gift of wisdom. If any man acts wisdom, lacks wisdom, let them ask. You guys know that? Right? Anyone lack the Holy Spirit, I need wisdom. Anybody ever done that? Or maybe you don't use Holy Spirit, maybe you use Lord. Lord, I need wisdom. Does wisdom come? <laughs> yes, it does. Holy in the words of knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to know what you do not know. And you know what? You need to know what you do not know. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I need to know what I don't know. There's lots of things. So God, the Holy Spirit is given to us in a very basic element to help us discern and guide our lives. I used to work, I was, uh, I, I, you know, I was broke, didn't have any money, right? Like, you know, like, really? So I, I come from brokenness. I come from shot out. Jesus has been my everything, right? He's been my everything. He is the restorer and the reclaimer of lost heritage. He has rebuilt my life from the ground up, and the sky's the limit. So I'm a walking testimony of the stuff that I talk about. I'm not talking about this in theory. I'm talking about it in practice. And so I remember I was 20 years old. I was broke as could be. I didn't have anything, to, anything going on. I'm working a job. I need money. Okay? I have a decent job opportunity, a decent wage scale. But in order for me to move up, I have to know things. And I didn't know what I needed to know. I went to school for building construction. And I moved down here because there was a building boom going on but there's an entirely different way that they build down here than where I was trained in. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They build differently down here. And so someone's like, yeah, I know, right? So they build differently. So I didn't know. So I, I'm, in a, I'm in a circumstance and I'm in a situation and I don't know what I'm doing. And I asked the Holy Spirit. I said, I was just, so here's the deal. I was a young, naive believer. I got saved at 20 years old. I gave my life back to Christ, I should say. I had faithful grandma who prayed for me and led me to Jesus when I was five. But I didn't know anything, so I just lived a reckless, abandoned life for the rest of the other 15 years. But thank you, Grandma, for that faithfulness in my life. And so anyway, I'm 20 years old, months before my 21st birthday. Oons, 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 right? Ready? Looking forward to that day. And I come to Jesus. <laughs> Cutting that plan right off. But I was so naive. I didn't know anything. And I'm learning and I'm experiencing things that I had never seen before. And I just started asking the Lord to show me what I don't know. And he, you know what he did? He started showing me what I don't know. I would, not only, I would sit with people and I would kind of glean from their wisdom, but the Holy Spirit empowered and revealed knowledge to me. Not only did he empower and reveal knowledge, he empowered and enabled retention. He enabled me to retain great and mighty things that I knew not of. 
That's what happened to me. A lot of times what happens, most Christians, when you're trying to get them into the spirit, you have to unwind them. It takes two years to unwind this person from all of the religious teaching that they've had and all of their false perceptions just to get them at zero. So you have to unwind them, get them to zero in order to move them into the kingdom of which they have no concept at their current state. We're not a church culture. We're not a world culture. We're a kingdom culture. Church creates its own culture, FYI. Not everything that is church culture is kingdom culture. What does Jesus want? He's not looking for church culture, ladies and gentlemen. He's not looking for the world's culture. He's looking for kingdom culture. We are kingdom culture people. And the Holy Spirit is the epicenter of the kingdom. And so the Lord began to deal with me because I didn't know anything. But most Christians, like even when they come here and they hear some of the things, they're like, man, you're really wrecking me. You're wrecking my theology. I'm like, yeah, you've been taught wrong. You've been taught wrong. All of the things that you know nothing. You want kingdom rule one, you know nothing. Oh, I know nothing. Pastor, I've been through six years of Bible school. I've been in ministry for 25 years. How dare you tell me I know nothing? I'm going to look right at you. You know nothing. If you want kingdom, kingdom requires you knowing nothing. You have to know nothing. So long as your ego's in the way, so long as you think you know something, he's the Holy Spirit's not working with you. He doesn't work with you and your knowledge. He shows you. You follow him. So long as your ego, oh, I got this, I got this, he's not doing anything. You have to be willing to lay aside what you think you know, or you won't go anywhere. You can have Christianity, you can have doctrine, you can have church, you can, build all, you can do all kinds of wonderful things without him. That's proven. But I don't want that. I want kingdom. I want power. We're going to stand in the halls of faith, and you're going to see Paul. You're going to stand in the halls of faith, and you're going to see Jeremiah. You're going to stand in the halls of faith, and you're going to see Ezekiel. What will be the testimony of your life? What would be the testimony of this generation? Oh, they cut you in two because of your faith? What'd you guys do? We closed our churches because somebody had a cold. <laughs> a point zero 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 point six percent chance of dying, and we shut the whole thing down. We preached from our living room. We didn't preach from our pulpit. If that offends you, I make no apologies. I make no apologies. This church didn't close for one flipping day. I didn't tell anybody to come. I didn't do anything. I said, I'm not close. I said, Holy Spirit, you want me to? No. Off the rip. I had so many emails, so many people, bro. How dare you, pastor, not close the church? You're endangering people. I'm like, there's five people here. Who am I endangering? One there, one there, one there, one there. Other than a hazmat suit, there's nobody being endangered. <laughs> Preach from your living room. I said, that'd be great. Jesus didn't call me to my living room. He called me to preach the kingdom, and he's appointed me to a place and said, speak the word in season and out, whether it's convenient or whether it's not. The coward will not inherit, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Read that. Revelation what, 19? The cowardly have no inheritance in the kingdom, capitulating to a culture rather than standing in the kingdom culture, proclaiming light. Instead, we become salt, good for nothing. And what, look at the church right now. Because of her capitulation, she is salt without savor, and she is trampled underfoot. It's never happened. In the history of this nation, no government has ever dared tell a church they can't close. Look it up. It has never happened. Never has the government closed the doors of a church. But not this generation. Weak and voiceless. When we stand, they win. Pastor in L.A., sued the city of L.A., won millions of dollars against the city because the city was not allowed to make them close. Yeah? Only one guy. None of these big-time pastors had anything to say about it. None of them. TV ministries, nobody said anything because they have too much to lose. That's the problem. Right? They don't understand who they are. They don't understand who they serve. I serve a king. I'm not under the authority of a government. I'm under the authority of a king. As he wills, I do. As he speaks, I say, I don't compi I'm not under your government. Is it better to obey you or to obey God? Well, tell the pastors of this generation and see what they say. Well, we need to be safe. We need to this, pastor. We need to that. Let the bride come out of her chamber. Let the bride come out of her chamber. <laughs> it's not the people. It's the leadership. God's not looking at the people. He's looking at a weak and cowardly leadership. To the angel of the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Sardis. Who? To the pastor of the church of Sardis. To the pastor of the church of Laodicea. He's speaking to the leaders. Weak.
cowardly leaders, Christian. Follow lions. I don't know where you want to find a lion, but you go find a lion and you follow the lion. You follow a guy that will be faithful unto death. You follow a church that will be faithful unto death and you'll see victory more than you will defeat. You make covenants with weakness. We make covenants with fear. And we've just now bound ourselves to a spirit of fear. Watch the church for the next 10 years. Every fearful trembling she will submit to. Why? Because we just made an agreement with the devil. We bound ourselves in a covenantal relationship with the devil. I said, no way. I know what that does. There is no way. No way. Sherry's like, what are you going to do? I go, they don't have no right to close me. Article 1 of the Constitution says I'm allowed to assemble. Nobody here. Then come in the door. We'll have a conversation. I'll say, look around. Nobody here. I'm talking to a camera. Yeah. What, what do you want to do? But thank God we had leadership in our, we, had leader, we have leadership in our state and our government that's greater than the leadership of our own churches. If that, again, if that offends you, I make no, no, make no apologies. Jesus is a rock of offense. That's what he does. You don't think he rebukes his leaders? He is. I believe he's looking over his leadership and he's trying to figure out who, who he can count on. So what's Jesus doing during COVID? He's like, well, who can I count on? Well, I thought I could count on them, but they all ran to the hills. Let me see if I got anybody here I can count on. Who's faithful? Who stands? Who runs in fear? Again, it's not the people, it's the leadership. Yeah? One pastor in California, $8 million. He just won from the city of LA. They tried to shut that guy time and time again. He kept putting injunction after injunction. John MacArthur, look him up. You may not agree with John MacArthur, but he's the only one brass enough to open up his mouth. None of them did. None of them. And what happens is the church looks for leaders and they have none. And sheep become scattered. Right? That's what happens. Look it up. He just won a huge lawsuit. City of LA. They were trying to take it. They couldn't stop him from opening. He's like, we're opening. I dare you. They took his parking lot away. Even though he had a lease because it was a city lot. He sued him. He said, all right. I'm not bringing the fight. But if you want to, Jehovah Shaboleth is on the way. So let's go. I don't know. I have a lot to say about that. It bothers me. It bothers me. The weakness of the church. We are the light of the world. We're an unstoppable force when we know what we are. We're an unstoppable force when we know who we are. And that is only possible with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> My wife's waving me. It's enough, Kevin. It's enough. You've made your point. Grace upon my wife, Sherry. So we have discernment gifts, wisdom, knowledge, knowing what you don't know, distinguishing of spirits, knowing what to, what's of God and what's not. We have declarative gifts, the prophetic, the tongues, the interpretation of tongues, teaching, leadership, exhortation. These are spirit-empowered gifts available to all believers for the profit of all. Yeah, maybe there's somebody out there in virtual land that needed me to say that. It's probably going to send me an email. And we have dynamic gifts, the gift of faith, the gift of healings, the gift of miracles, the gifts of compassion, the gifts of generosity. These are all gifts that are given to us that come out of our lives with the power of the Holy Spirit. You have access to wisdom. You have access to knowledge. You have access to the mind of genius, mind of God, mind of Christ. You have access. You have access to discernment. Anybody ever did something and you didn't think you should do it and you did it anyway? Anybody with me? Ever done that? Yeah. I bought a chicken one time at, uh, this is many, this is a simple one. I bought a chicken one time at the, one of those roasters, and I'm like there, and I'm like, yeah, that's the big one. I'm going to buy that big one. It was a little off, looked a little yellow, but, you know, hey, not bad. It's still a big chicken. And, <laughs> and I'm feeling the Holy Spirit. I could just feel the Lord going, and no, dude, not that one, not that one. And I bought it, and I had food poisoning for four days. So, yeah. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I'm laying on the couch, and I've got, like, my stomach's doing this, I thought like the alien was going to come out, you know. I was seeing, I literally was seeing colors. Like, you know, like the Wonder Bread wrapper, you know what I'm talking about? With all the, all the dots. I was, I was seeing like Wonder Bread colors. I'm laying on the couch. And I'm like, I didn't know where I was. It was crazy. But we all can look back. We have an ability to discern, right? Not just spirits. Is this of the Lord? Is this of the enemy? Is this of me? Whatever it is. You have the ability to discern atmospheres. You have declarative gifts that call forth, and you have dynamic gifts. All are given for the profit of all and to benefit all. Spirit-powered actions, not mere human emotions. So I shared this in first service because we, we, um, we baptized a bunch of lionesses there yesterday. Uh, on uh, Yeah, like what, nine women, I think, at the beach. It was crazy. It was good. It was like a inner side. It was good stuff. But I felt like the Lord was showing me things as I was kind of giving them word and everything is that not all compassion is spiritual compassion. 
Let me say that again. Not all compassion is spiritual compassion. Sometimes human compassion is, leads you. What happens, people like, so th- this is a dynamic gift, so which means it's an impactor. The dynamic gifts are the things that go boom, right? The, the discerning gifts are the things that kind of guide our lives. The declarative gifts are the kind of the things that project forward. But the, but the dynamic gifts are the things that go boom. And one of the things that makes the world go boom is compassion, but not just compassion from a human standpoint. The compassion God's asking us for, is calling us towards, or what we have access to, is greater than the United Way. It's greater than the Red Cross. What happens a lot of times with believers who have high gifts of compassion? Your compassion is meant to impact the world. But what happens so often is that the people that have high levels of, or are led, or very, or compassion is at the forefront of their gift set. They they allow uh, every little need to draw out their compassion, and they find themselves exhausted and ultimately ineffective. And so not every piece of compassion, Christian, is godly compassion. It ends up, lead, it ends up draining you. So what has to happen, like Jesus walked by people. I don't know if you read that or not. He walked right by them, walked right by them. Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and says, heal my daughter. He said, you don't give what is holy to dogs and you don't give the children's bread. You know, healing is the children's bread, it's not for you. He told her that right to you. There was a lot of compassion there. Here, my daughter, it seems like a compassionate thing to do. He is Jesus, right? But he said, no, I have no covenant with you. I have no relationship with you. My compassion for you extends only this far until she demonstrated faith. And then once she demonstrated faith, well, then Jesus bridged the faith. And that's hard for us to believe, but that's exactly what happened. He walked by people all the time. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus didn't know she was there. Of course she was, right? Blind Bartimaeus. Didn't matter to Jesus until it mattered to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had to cry out from the depths of his heart. Then and only then did Jesus stop. Son of God, have mercy on me. Son of God, have mercy on me. And all of the crowd was the one, shut up. He doesn't want to hear you. And Bartimaeus saw his opportunity. He cried out all the latter. What happened? There was a shift in Bartimaeus' heart. When what he wanted became what he wanted. And when Jesus heard the cry of his heart, then he turned. But until it reached the level of his heart, Jesus, it didn't matter. He kept right on going. That's not compassionate. Exactly. Human compassion is not always spiritual compassion. One of the things you use to discern the spiritual compassion is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, is a discerner of, it divides soul from spirit, bone from marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the Holy Spirit, the prophetic Word of God, the Holy Spirit Word God, the Holy Spirit Rhema God, reveals to us what's of God and what's not compassionate people, you need to exercise that. Just because it's compassionate doesn't mean you need to move on it. Just because there's a need doesn't mean you need, you need to move on it. The poor you have with us always. How could Jesus not be compassionate? How could Jesus not listen to Judas when he wanted to sell the alabaster box? Because human compassion is not always spiritual compassion. You understand that? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you guys are really quiet. It's like really quiet. Shh. <laughs> I like some action. Give me some action. All are given to the profit of all. Spirit-empowered actions. We're called to live in and from the Holy Spirit. 30 times it tells us to be filled and to walk in the Spirit. You have access to the gifts, but you also have access to fruits. Right? So the, in Galatians chapter 5, not only do we have gifts, we have fruit. This is very practical. This is something that you can access in everyday life. It's the, the word fruit. Anybody ever heard, uh, you need to grow in the fruit of the Spirit? Anybody here at all? You ever heard that? You need, we need to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Problem is, is you can't grow in the fruit of the Spirit. It's impossible. You need Jesus. And not only that's not what it's saying. It's the Greek word harpezo. And it means the prophet of the vine. It means fruit that's already come off the vine. So when it tells you the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that comes off the vine, it's not telling you to grow in the Spirit. It's telling you to take the fruit off the vine. Harpezo. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. So you need love? Boom. Take the fruit off the vine. You need joy? Boom. Take the fruit off the vine. Harpezo. You need peace? Take the fruit of Holy Spirit. Anybody done? We've all done this one. Lord, I need peace right now. All right? Peace comes. Fruit off the vine. Lord, I need patience right now. Anybody with me? Yeah? Patience comes, doesn't it? All of a sudden, you just feel You don't understand it. Peace that passes understanding. Patience that comes because you're taking fruit off the vine. You're not growing in it. You're not standing there going, oh, give me peace. I got to get patience. Patience has got to come. I got to grow some patience right now. It's harpezo. Take the fruit that's already there. And there's more than, there's more than enough. Goodness, full faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, such there's no law. Jesus has plenty of fruit. He's not running out of patience. You need patience all day long. You need a bushel? Here you go. Have a bushel of patience. Eat it as you go. 
Need love, right? If you're married, you need a lot of patience. You got kids, you need a lot of long-suffering too. Gentleness, self-control. I do this a lot. This is something that happens to me. I mean, I'm in ministry, and uh, full disclosure, I'm not always the kindest person in the world. You? No way. The only, ab- the only ability you have to minister Christ is through the Holy Spirit. If you ever do what I do, you ever stand in a place that I stand, and you, you, you encounter people at, at the level that I, that I end up having, I interface with people, right? I'm like available, right? Not because I want to, because I am. That's just the way it is. And so I'm, I'm up close and personal. A lot of times people come to me with things that I don't have the patience for, and quite frankly, I don't even have the mercy for. <laughs> and I'm not really feeling kind. I'm like, no. Pastor, you live in a glory bubble. No, I try to live for the Holy Spirit. So the person will come to me, and this will help you. You'll feel like you don't want to be kind to that person, and you'll just say, Holy Spirit, give me kindness now. Show me the kindness that you have for this person, and the kindness comes. And I'm able to bring forth kindness to that person that I myself don't have. I'm able to bring forth patience for that person that I myself don't have. You with me? Because I'm harpezo. I'm taking the fruit off the vine. It's mine. You're in the vine. He's the vine. We're the branches. Right? We can draw from it. It's just being honest, right? You've got to be honest with yourself. You're not always patient. Yeah, you're not always patient. You're not always kind. You're not always self-controlled. You've got to take the fruit off the vine. Sometimes you want to rage. Anybody with me? Sometimes you want to send that email. Post that picture. You know? Fire off that Facebook post. Sometimes you want to. And you don't have the self-control. And you're like grabbing the table and you say, Holy Spirit, I need the self-control. Harpezo. I need to draw self-control from a place where I don't have it, and the Holy Spirit has the self-control without limit. When you don't have it, it's because you're not drawing for it. You have not because you ask not. These are things that are available to us and the power that we have in the Spirit. John 15 says, live in me, and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it lives in the vine. You have to live in Christ. He's everything. It's not like you look at Jesus. You live in him. He's everything. Neither can you unless you live in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who lives in me and I in him bears much fruit. Ready? Here's my life verse. Ready? For without me, you can do nothing. (laughs) You can't do anything. You can't bear fruit in of yourself. That's what he's saying. So you can't manifest patience. You can't grow the fruit of the Spirit. You have to draw from the fruit of the Spirit. You have to harpezo. You can't grow it yourself. You can't. You cannot produce fruit in of yourself. But in me, you can. Power is given. We must be immersed. This is my favorite. This is what I'm talking about. We're called to live an immersed life. So I wanted to kind of just throw out there, we talked about the last few weeks, the gifts of the Spirit and things like that. So I just want to touch on that real quick. And then I want to touch on the, um, the fruit of the Spirit. But I also want to talk to you about this. We're called to live an immersed life. This, this, this is, these are, the, these are the, the central points. This is the transforming power of the believer. This is what separates us from everybody else. Do you know the rarest of all Christians are spirit-filled Christians? Did you know that? So look, you are treasures. You are opals, one of the rarest stones. People think diamonds are. No, opals are. Opals. Black opals especially. Black opals are the rarest, one of the rarest stones in the earth. Diamonds are common. They're just more valued. But the rarest stone is the opal. You guys are the opals of the kingdom because you're spirit-filled believers. The smallest percentage of, of people that actually believe what Jesus said. And we'll actually engage in the spirit. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. This is the power that separates you, not just from the world around you, but separates you from everybody else. You don't want to be a common Christian. Anybody here want to be a common Christian? Anybody? I say, yeah, man, I really want to be average. I want to follow Jesus and be average. <laughs> what separates you is learning to, learning to live from the immersion, learning to immerse and living from that immersion. You're called to live an immersed life. Acts chapter 1 says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons by the Father that's been put in his authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here's the disciples, right? Jesus, this is a transitional moment. So prior to this, the Holy Spirit was with them, parakletos. The Holy Spirit came in them. This is John 15. This is the moment when they had access to the immersion of the Holy Spirit. He uses a word when the Spirit comes upon you. It's epi. It means epidermis comes upon you. So now we, now we move from the Holy Spirit being with us, which he always is, the Holy Spirit being in us, charismai or charismata, and then the Holy Spirit being upon us, which is epi, transitional moment. And so they're sitting in here and they're asking Jesus, hey man, 
Are you going to restore everything now? Are you going to get me out of that job? You know, you're going to get me out of that relationship. Are you coming back, Lord? You're going to get me out of my geography. You're going to get me out of my circumstances. And Jesus says, your focus is on the wrong thing. Your focus is on the wrong thing. He says, your focus needs to be upon the power that is given to you. And your focus needs to be upon what the purpose of that power is. To be my martyr, to be my witness in Judea, in Samaria, in Jerusalem, to the ends of the earth, in your local geography, in, your, in the greater, greater concentric circles of influence. He's telling them right there, your focus is wrong. <laughs> Come on. Your focus is wrong. This is where the church is. We're all waiting for Jesus. We have large percentages of the churches that are waiting for the rapture. I'm all in on the rapture. I do rapture drills. I'm telling you, I got a Superman cape. I got a towel. Matthew chapter 24 says the angels are going to come and pick us up. They're going to give us a ride. The angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather as elect. So we're going to go on an angel ride. And I tell them, when the angel comes, I'm going to be, hold on. I've got to go in the house. I'm going to tie the towel around my neck. I'm going to go up like Superman. <laughs> What's up? I'm going up in style. I'm all in on the rapture. You know a church up north? They, they, 1970s, they built an enclave. They're still there 50 years later because they thought Jesus was coming back in the 70s. I've been there. People are still there. They haven't done anything. Culturally ineffective. Affected destiny in no way. But they're still there. You know what they have? They have a rapture field. So in case the rapture does come and they hear the, they hear the trumpet, they all run to the rapture field. I'm, you think I'm kidding? I'm not lying. That's the mentality of the church. Jesus is telling him right here, look, your focus is wrong. Your active focus needs to not be on that. That will come. It's not, that it's, not, it's not that it's not important. It's just not the central theme of this kingdom. If you want to know, the Holy Spirit is the central thing of this kingdom. And the Holy Spirit precedes only the king's dominion. The Holy Spirit is given to us to bring forth the king's dominion. That's what he wants on earth as it is. That's the central theme. He's sitting here and he's correcting his disciples and he's saying, guys, you're looking in the wrong place. Looking in the wrong place. You have power upon you in order to testify. You have power in order to empower your business in order to testify. You have power in order to empower you in the workplace in order to testify. You have power in order to empower you in whatever field you're in, in your marriage, in your relationships, whatever. The power is given to you to, to empower you in order to testify. That your family would be a witness, that your light would be a witness, that whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You know, you know, maybe you want to stand on a street corner and proclaim Jesus. Hey, go. Do it. Like, I want out of here. He's like, wrong. The Spirit of God comes upon us. Here's the big thing. I just want to share this real quick. All right? Let's contrast this. There were 120 people that waited in the same room for 10 days. They, they're asking Jesus. He tells them to go to Jerusalem and wait for power. So 120 people go to an upper room, and they wait there for 10 days. All right? How many bathrooms did they have? We don't know. Who cooked too clean? We don't know. What about their families? We don't know about that either. But what we do know is that they were hungry for the promise of God. And they were willing to do whatever it took to be a part of the promise that Jesus had made. Nothing else mattered to them. This is what we know. What the, the modern church wants a little shiver, a little shikamo shy. We got it. When you're done, pastor, we're going home. They were there 10 days. 10 days. Waiting. Crazy. I don't think we'd make it 10 hours. Well, he said he was coming. I don't know. What's Jesus? Did he, anybody here got a time schedule on this? Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting so long? He didn't even give them a date. He just told them, wait. Nuts. The hunger for the fulfillment of the promise was greater than anything else. The hunger was greater than anything else. That's what it takes. It takes that. Power comes from the immersion and the immersion is vice versa. What are keys to immersion? I'll give you a couple. Right? Immersion. Luke chapter 4, Jesus being filled with the Spirit. Jesus was baptized. Why was he baptized? He's baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't sin. He didn't need a baptism of repentance. Jesus is the divine prototype of the new creation. As he is, so are we in this world. Christ is the divine prototype. Fulfill it to, to permit it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. It was, he's a model to show us the way. Everything he did, he did in the active presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Everything. He became filled with the Spirit, went out into the wilderness, tempted of the devil. He ate nothing. He was hungry. The devil tempted him with his hunger. After all of this takes place, I'll, I'll, back it, I'll try to open it up a little bit. It says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went out into the surrounding regions. 
No miracle was performed until Christ came out of the, out of the desert, until he was, comes out in the power of the Spirit. There was no miracle performed. He's the Son of God that came as man and lived in and from the power of the Holy Spirit to model for you not what is possible. Anybody ever heard the phrase, greater works than these shall we do? Anybody with me? Greater works. What are greater works? I don't know. I heard a pastor said, well, I think greater works is building hospitals. I'm like, what? I don't think he's saying building hospitals. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. And when he goes to the Father, he sends to us the Holy Spirit. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So the first thing that has to happen, one of the keys, we're, li- we're supposed to live immersed. So you can, you can activate the immersion of the kingdom. You can activate the immersion of the power of God upon your life. You can through worship. You feel that immersion. You, that's what that is. That's not just the presence of God. That is the immersion of the Holy Spirit. You've moved atmospheres. One of the ways you know you're in a different atmosphere is when time is gone, when time no longer becomes irrelevant. Three hours, and you're like, what? That seemed like five minutes. It's an immersion. You're in a different atmosphere. One of the things we have to do is we have to learn to be led. You want the power of the Holy Spirit active in your life. You have to learn to be led by Him. Jesus was led by the Spirit. What does that mean? It means deal with your limitations that prevent you from living immersed. We have limitations that prevent us from going to the places that in our spirits we know we want to go. Like what? So the Holy Spirit has to lead you, and he leads you where? To the desert. What is the word desert? In Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word debar, and it means to speak. Jesus leads you to a place to speak to you. Holy Spirit is in you, but the Holy Spirit is not content with living in a shed out behind your house. If you learn to listen to him, he wants to take over the whole operation. But most Christians keep shoving him out in the shed out behind the house and then go and knock on his door whenever they have a crisis or whenever they want a little tingle or a little shiver, they let him out. The Holy Spirit wants to take over the whole show. And one of the things he does is he wants to lead us to a place of speaking. What's he going to speak to me about? Ready? Hold the chair. Your ego. (gasps) You have been given access to fullness. Most Christians can't even get to measure, right? So we have this stage of believers that don't believe in the power of the Spirit. Forget it. They don't even get measure. Then we have those that will pursue the Lord, and they get, they get to a level of measure, and they settle. What if there was another place? What if there was fullness? What if you had access to fullness? You ever do things? I don't know how many, spirit, how many born-again, like, spirit-filled believers we have, but you ever get in the Spirit, and you're doing things, and, you're, 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 and you just feel like, man, there's another level here. You know, I can feel it. That, that, like, I can't get there, but I know there's another level. There's always another level. In my father's house, there are many rooms. Greek word, oranas. In my father's house, there are many realms. That's what that word means. My father's house, there are many mansions. I go there now to prepare a place for you. In the sweet by and by, I'm going to have a mansion in heaven. Ha, 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 ha. That's how we teach it. It's not how it reads in the Greek. In my father's house, there are many oranas. It means realms, places of habitation. In my Father's house, there are realms of habitation. I go there now to prepare a place for you. No, I go there now to provide access for you. My redemption, my blood, I ascend on your behalf. Mary, don't touch me. I have not ascended to my Father. And I have to prepare a place with my blood to give you access to realms unknown. Right? Oh, it's deep, dude. It's deep. (laughs) Powerful. World-changing world-changing, world-changing. I had to completely deconstruct my faith. So you guys want to hear a little story? We're all friends here, right? You're inspiring me. You know, so like, okay, so I, to, I'm, I'm going to, I have to bless my wife. So I come out of, so I'm, I'm getting to her in a second. I come out of spirit-filled churches. That was like my beginning, right? So if you don't know this journey, you, maybe you will. Uh, charismatic churches became charismaniac churches, right? So the power got all weird, got all wacky, left the rails, right? Became very ego-driven, became all about money and chicken clucking and just weird, weird, weird stuff. Nothing relevant to the kingdom or the power, but it got really weird. They went off the rails. I left the charismatic churches during that time. I was like, well, I don't even know. This is not for me. I left, and I was very averse to the Holy Spirit, and I was very averse to kingdom power, even though I knew it. I was born into the kingdom by power. 
I'm, I come to Christ. I don't know anything. I'm just like wide-eyed. I got people laying hands on me, and they're just speaking in tongues. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? Right? And then I realized they had something I didn't. And so I started, you know, that's another story. But I had really sort of drawn back from the Holy Spirit and things I was experiencing at that time, a Category 10 hurricane in my life. And I realized my theology did not have the power to overcome my circumstances. I realized that my belief system could not manifest the overcoming power that was given to me. That all the spiritual principles and all the little exercises and checking all the box was irrelevant to what I was facing. I was subjected to something that I was promised authority over. Anybody here? When your theology can't overcome your circumstances, your theology is wrong. When what you believe about God and the Holy Spirit, whatever you believe, if it does not have the authority to overcome what you're facing, your theology is wrong. We are overcomers off the rip. We are the ones who hold it back, not the Lord. The problem's on our side. And until you come to that equation, until you come to that understanding, you'll never move in victory. We blame God. The problem's not with God. The problem's with us. We can't move the rock. That's the issue. We can't move the rock. And so we have to ask the Lord, why can't I move the rock? What, what, what is it here? I know you've told me this. Anybody been told something from the Lord and you can't get it? Are we here? You know Jesus told you that. But you just can't get it? Or every time you feel it, you feel pushed back? Or your hand is slapped away? Some version of that? And then we start thinking, oh, it must be God's will for me to not have it. Timing, brother. Timing. No, 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 no. None of that. There's a problem on your side of the equation. What is that problem? It could be many things. But there's a problem over here that is preventing you from that. And until you deal with the problem, it's only going to stay out there and it's going to be linked. You have to confront these issues. Anyway, another story. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at this place and I can't overcome what I'm facing. What I'm facing is owning me. Owning me. <laughs> I was owned. And I'm like, this, is, this, this just isn't right. This, I just, I just, and I realized all of the placating stupid things that I was doing. That's why I say Holy Spirit every single week. He won't hear me not say him. Because I was not engaging the power of God that was mine by inheritance for that period of time. And I suffered the consequences of it. But God used the famine and this destruction in my life to cause me to look for greater things. And I realized that none of these pastors, none of these leaders, no book, no one had the answer for me. Nobody. No, oh, they would all give me just, oh, read your Bible. Oh, just confess faith. Oh, it must be God's will. They would all give me the same placating, nonsensical answers, every single one of them like robots. They would regurgitate to me the same answers that were not sufficient for me. I'm like, no way. I know this is real. I know it. And so I started pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. But I was very averse to charismatic things. My beloved wife drags me, kicking and screaming, to a conference. So guys, if you're there, I hear you. Let your wife drag you from time to time. I'm like, I don't want to go. We're going. I'm like, we're not going. Then I'm in the car. I'm like, all right, we're going. <laughs> she takes me to this conference. And again, I'm learned of the Spirit, but my concept, here's my point, my concept of the Holy Spirit and my concept of how he worked and who he was was completely wrong. My theology was wrong. My framing of my understanding of him was wrong. And, I, and I, I didn't want to go because I thought it was going to be certain things and it was going to be certain things. So we go to this thing and I'm, I'm really, you know, kind of apprehensive, but I'm, go, I'm there, I'm engaging, I'm doing my best. And a lot of things happened, a lot of moments happened that really just shattered my illusions and the Lord showing me like, you don't, know, you don't know anything, Kevin. You think you know you're completely wrong. You can stay in your stupidity or you can move with me to another place. One of the things that happened, we were there, we were driving around the city and they had this really cool church and they had all this like rustic, um, like repurposed metal on the outside of the building and so we're standing there and I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's so cool, right? And there's like four of us around the corner, yeah, around the corner from the back of the church comes these four guys, like just totally like just cruising up and like walking up and I'm like looking at him. Guy walks right up to me, grabs my hand. He says, you're a warrior. And he says, you have calluses on your hands and you have scars on your heart. And he says, the fight you're in isn't over, but the Lord's promising you victory. And I was like, what? 
And meanwhile, I shared this in first service. I'm like holding the guy's hand, and it felt like I was like this wind was just blowing over me. But in reality, I was just standing there looking at him like this, you know? But it was like so powerful. And then these guys start talking to me about this one guy's like, yeah, man, I got this idea from this business. And he's like, this is what the Holy Spirit's showing me. And he's, they start telling me all this crazy stuff. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, I'd never encountered Christians like this before in my life. And I'm like, wow, man, I'm really impressed. And one dude looks at me and goes, yeah, man, we're just coming off a 10-day soak. I'm like, a 10-day soak? I'm like, can you do that? A 10-day soak? And these dudes were like glowing, immersed, encountering God at deep levels for great things, great and mighty things. And when I was there, something happened to me. Something just shifted. I said, I don't know what I just experienced, but whatever that is, that's what I'm doing. Whatever that is, that's the transformation for me. They, they were alive. That guy read my mail. He didn't know anything about me. He didn't know anything about me. I mean, the, the depth of which he spoke to me, and I just gave you a little snippet, was like beyond my understanding. I mean, he went right at me, and he told me. And then we were there, and I was sharing first service too, same thing. There's a group of them going, yeah, we're having a furnace tonight, man. We're having a furnace tonight. You guys should come by for the furnace. I'm like, what's a furnace? You guys do furnaces? What's a furnace? Like, we just go there and we burn, man. We burn with the power of God. We burn. I'm like, wow. <laughs> do I want a furnace or do I want to immerse? A soak? Do I want a soak? Do I want to? I was like, I want to do both. Changed me entirely. Changed me entirely. And that was just one part of the journey. But the thing is, is that my thinking was wrong. You have to deal with the limitations that keep you from being there. What you need to tell yourself, I don't care what your, I don't care what your teaching says. Say it with me. The Lord is not holding me back. The problem is on my side. That's why he's got to talk to you about your ego, because you don't think it is. You don't think it is. You know everything. Oh, no, no, you know it. Oh, no, it's not that. Oh, no, it's not that. Your ego automatically protects your vulnerability. Your ego automatically rises to protect the area of your life that's most vulnerable. That's why. Jesus has to get on the other side of what is vulnerable to you in order to heal you. But your ego is the natural response to protect your vulnerability. And so the enemy keeps you in bondage because you cannot let go of your ego. Just a thought. You have to deal with your limitations, your vulnerability, your, your ego, your scratched lenses. Most people perceive God through scratched lenses, through damage and pain that they've suffered, for wounds that they suffered, and they view God through the scratched lenses of experiences that they had that were neither from him at all nor willed by him in any way. We view God not good. God's not good because we've experienced so much pain in our life. We view God as hurtful because we've experienced so much pain in our life. We have scratched lenses. You have to deal with your scratched lenses. Say this, any area of my life that does not have glistening hope is under the influence of a lie. 100%. Any area of your life that does not have glistening hope is under the influence of a lie. What lie do you believe? that said your business is going down? What lie do you believe that said your marriage is over? What lie do you believe that said your children will never come back? What lie do you believe? Wherever there's no hope, there is, that is under the direct influence and dominance of a lie. Where does that lie come from? What's the truth? That's another story. You gotta deal with your limitations, bad teaching. Oh my gosh, all day long, that's what I say. Like I have new believers and I'm like, happy day. You wanna learn the Holy Spirit? We're gonna set you up like a rocket. We gotta take these religious Christians and we gotta unwind them. Most of them can't make the journey. They're wound too tight in their doctrine. <laughs> I believe the Lord heals as he wills. Yeah? Jesus heals everybody. You can manifest healing. I had a woman here, she, I, you know I me, mean? rheumatoid arthritis, we've seen it healed by probably four times since then. All the time. We see, there's certain things we see, boom, no problem. Woman here, she has rheumatoid arthritis, her whole body's crap, cranking down on me, she, on her. She, she wants to leave. She's telling me all this stuff. She's like, oh, I don't believe in the power. I don't believe in the power and this whole stuff. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. We're, we're, we're about power. You know, and she's telling me all this stuff, and, I'm, and she wants to fly to the Cleveland Clinic to get a new lung. I'm like, you'll, fl you'll fly to the Cleveland Clinic and spend thousands of dollars on doctors. And I said, but you won't take your place in a prayer line? Jesus doesn't have a problem with doctors. He has a problem being second. And I told her, she's like, well, you prayed for me once. I said, let me pray for you three or four times. It's the working of miracles, Christian. <laughs> Sometimes miracles, you got to work them. We got to find out what's going on here. We got to get to the bottom of this. What right does the enemy have? Oh, I don't believe the devil has any rights. <laughs> We're stupid. Stupid. We are our own worst enemy. We literally are. 
So that was a problem, but we've seen many people healed of rheumatoid arthritis, seen cancerous tumors gone all the time, all the time. Margie saw a dead man get up, did you not? Or at least he was pretty close to dead. Boom, she laid hands on him, Pff, up guy comes. Takes his sitting up, talking. Connie shook a woman and she came back to life, right? That's just there. It's not just here, it's in the lives of the people. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and deal with issues of the flesh. Cleanse lepers. That's the mandate on the church. Yeah. Before anything else, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. That's an emphatic comparative upon the church. It's commanded of us. We're supposed to produce this. And if we don't, we need to ask why. Cultural relevancy, overwhelming demands of life. This is a big one. You got to deal with, you got to learn. I'm, I'm almost done. Just give me five minutes. I'll wrap it up. You got to learn to be led. And you have to deal with the things that keep you from hearing the Lord, that keep you from this communion with the Holy Spirit. Some of you have bad teaching. Some of you are too, too busy trying to be culturally relevant that your kingdom ineffective. Your focus is on the wrong thing. Other people are overwhelmed with the demands of life. Family, kids, job, cars, bills, distractions. Hello, can I get a witness? You have to create space and create a margin. Create space. When? Get up early. Go to bed later. Drive in your car. You know, find, to find a way. Go out at lunch. I don't, I don't know what, you're, what the rhythm of your day is. Create a space where you're consistently. You may not be able to do it seven days a week, but can you do it three or four? Right? Can you create a margin and a space, begin to commune with the Lord, begin to commune with the Holy Spirit consistently? Worship, adop, uh, worship, adoration, listening, engaging. It's basically like this. It's not, oh, Lord, I need, I need, I need. I'll give you a really powerful one. First service didn't get this one, but you can have this one. Do you want it? Yeah. All right, come back next week, and I'll give it to you. No, I'll give it to you. All right, so I'll give you a, I'll, this a dominant key. You want the Lord to lead you? Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what are you doing? The Bible says grace is in the eyes of the Lord. The word grace is spiritual power moving in love. So what is God empowering what he's looking at? The question is, is what is he looking at? We want him to look at us. Wrong answer. Lord, what are you looking at? What matters to you? What are you saying? What are you doing? What are you saying? What area of my life do you want to look at? What area of my life do you want to focus on? What area of this world do you want to focus what, you know, on? What, what is he looking at? Not what are you looking at. Uh, that's, that's transformative, what I'm telling you right now. Th th this isn't common stuff you're hearing. I'm giving you, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a massive key I just gave you. Lord, what are you looking at? What matters to you? After the Holy Spirit gets over his shock that you actually asked him that kind of a question, most people never ask that question. It's about, you know, when you start asking him that, you reach that place you're asking, you're going to see that things open up. He'll show you. He'll teach you. Another story. Jesus has a plan. He needs you. So you have to deal with the wildernesses in your life. You have to confront the issues behind your fallen nature. There's wildernesses in your life, Christian. You have to learn to be led to the Lord. You have to learn to be led by the Lord. You have to let the Lord begin to lead you. The Holy Spirit begin to lead you. And you have to let him identify things in your life. That's what happened with the devil. What's he dealing with Jesus on? Right? He's dealing with Jesus on the very same thing that Adam fell from. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Right? Ego. Right? Selfish desires of the eye. Selfish desires of the being and the pride of life. And bigger than all of them, he's dealing with him on identity. He, te he, he tempted him in three areas, but he asked him the same question three times. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, do you know who you are? That's, it. that's his, off the rip, that's his first question. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you are? Eh? I'm a son of the highest. I'm loved on my worst day. Jesus is for me when he, when always, when, even when I'm against me. I have kingdom authority in this world and in the one to come. I know exactly what I am. No devil has authority. I have it. And if that devil has any authority over me, he's going to claim his right, and I'm going to renounce it. And I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll have no, nothing will master me. I'm mastered only by the Spirit of God. Nothing will master me. I know exactly who I am. Christian, you're challenged with your identity. Do you know you're loved? Do you know your value? Do you know your worth? That's what makes you afraid. You're afraid because you don't know you're loved. You're afraid because you don't believe your father's good. You're afraid because you don't believe your father's going to come through for you. Those are lies that you believe, not in your mind, but in your soul. It's a reactive response that reveals the lie. Uh-huh. When you get fearful and <gasps> shut down, you don't believe God's good. You don't, because if you did, you wouldn't be reacting like that. And so there's a lie in your soul. Where's that lie come from? I don't know. But there's a lie in your soul that needs to be dealt with. It needs to be undone. 
and then you go free. And who the sun sets free is free indeed, right? There's a process to it, but you can, it can happen. How do you know? I help myself more than I help anybody else. I know these things because I can't get what I want. Nobody can tell me what I want. I can't get me there, so he shows me. When you react that way, it's so powerful. It's extremely powerful. You can go free. Man, I believe God wants an army of absolutely egoless, victorious believers that know what they are, that know who they are, and will not settle for anything less than what the Lord has for them, and are willing to do whatever it takes to get there, including destroying their ego. (gasps) I don't have ego. Yeah, let the Lord challenge you, and you'll see that you have ego. You all do, every one of you. And God will dismantle your ego. But, it's, but if you want to seek to preserve it, the one who seeks to save his life will lose it. The one who loses his life from my sake. Well, that's salvation. Yeah, but it also applies in areas of your life that God wants to dismantle. You want to hold that? Well, then you'll keep it. You want to dismantle it? You won't go to the vulnerable places? Then you'll keep those places where the wounds lie because the wound is in the vulnerable. You're wounded. All of us are. And the ego protects the wound. And the enemy triggers the wound and the ego denies it. It's crazy. People get close to this church. We do a lot of inner healing and deliverance here. People get close to the church, and as soon as they get close to me or something like that, they just freak out. I don't know why. Well, I think I know why. <laughs> because they have issues, right? And they don't want those issues exposed. You're not exposing them to me. It's, not, it's nothing to do with me. It's just, that the, the, I mean, I, I guarantee you the devil knows exactly who I am. <laughs> I guarantee it. And I'm not bragging about that. But we set captives free here. We set people free from wounds and traumas and issues within their life. And what ends up happening is we carry this baggage and the church pretends it's not there. And we're filled with it. We're laden with it. Oh, we don't have any problems. We're all free in Christ. Really? Look around, man. Look around. All right. I'm getting too loose. I'm getting too loose. I'm going to come back. Getting too loose. (laughs) Got to close. Getting too loose, Kevin. (laughs) Get back. Right? You have to deal with this because it affects your destiny. If you have an issue, you have a deep-rooted issue with anger, Every time you move out into something God has for you, the devil will trigger your anger and cause you to be set back. If you have an issue with fear, every time you move out with fear, he's going to trigger that fear and you're going to go back. You will never get past that point, ever. How do you know? I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why Christians can't get into destiny. I didn't say you can't have success. There's a difference between success and destiny. Just a thought. Fullness is determined. No, I don't want to get into all this. I'll have to talk more if I have to do it. You have access to great and mighty things. Say this, I have access to great and mighty things that are practical for the everyday. The Holy Spirit has called me to live an immersed life. If I want to go further, I must confront the limitations within me and around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me pray over you. Father, I just thank you for these beautiful people. I thank you for these humble people, Lord, who submit their hearts, Lord. I pray that every word that I've spoken, Lord, would be edifying. I pray that every word, Lord, would be empowered by you and that the word that is sent forth would accomplish it only and only for what you've sent it forth to do and it would not return to you void. I give you glory, Father. I bless them again. I honor them, Lord, for their humility and their desire to hear more of you and to, to draw from more of you. We only ask that you be glorified in all things in Jesus' name. Let me bless you one more time. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you in every way. And may he give you peace. And may you forever live within his kingdom. In Jesus' name. God loves you. <laughs> we love you. I'll be over there if you want to. So if anybody want to lay fists on me, go over there.